Hey, before we get started this week, I just wanted to give everyone a quick update on BJJ Mental Models Premium. I think at this point we've got over 32 hours of educational jujitsu material on there. We just launched a new seven-part premium series with Rob Bernacki, another six-part premium series with Preet Mikkelsen, so a lot of good reasons to check out Premium if you haven't already. Please do take a second and do me a favor, check it out, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. There is a free trial, so you can check it out at no cost. Again, if you haven't looked already, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 169. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, hanging out with Mr. Drew Foster, friend from the internet. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you today, Steve? I am doing pretty well myself. I'm just trying to queue up a whole bunch of episodes. I've been meaning to do one with you for a while because you've joined the ranks of internet jujitsu podcasters. So now you're part of the crew here. And hey, while we're at it, why don't you give everyone a bit of a plug here? Tell everyone just who you are and how they can check out your work. Yeah, sure. My name is Drew Foster. I'm a four stripe brown belt in North Carolina, and I have a podcast that's uh Fairly recent, less than a month old. Right now, I'm just calling it the Drew Dars Podcast. You can find it on Spotify, Apple. There's a few more obscure listings that I don't have it posted quite yet, but I'm working on it. And yeah, I, I mean, I may change the name for it, but right now, that is sort of the placeholder name I'm using. And I may just end up rolling with that. But you can find it pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. Yeah. And of course, I know you and probably a lot of listeners know you from your activity on Reddit. You're probably one of the most consistent and reliable contributors there. You uh, go under the name Darce Knight. Awesome name and probably related to what we're going to talk about here today. Yes, 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 I do. Yeah, I've been posting there, I think, probably five, six years, something like that. And yeah, just trying to do my best just to it kind of goes into a little bit of what I do on my podcast. I'm trying to gear a lot of stuff towards helping people, you know, that are, you know, blue belt, maybe even white belt, you know, people that are just, I remember jujitsu was just really difficult for me. And so I'm just trying my best to pay it forward. You know, it's done a lot for me. And anytime I see people post online and stuff, or if someone's struggling with something, I try to just take a couple minutes just to help out. So I'm trying to keep the episodes short and sweet for right now and keep it moving. Awesome. Well, I am happy to have you here. And on that note, you tell me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that you're a Darce guy. One of your favorite chokes, is that correct? That's fair to say. Yes, sir. (laughs) Well, then I am happy to have you here because this is actually a choke I have never really been particularly good at. I mean, I've kind of improved my my Darce game as I get deeper along, but it's just never really been a go-to for me. And we had uh, Matt Scaff on the podcast a while back to talk about the Anaconda. People really enjoyed that chat. So what I'd love to do is <laughs> literally do the reverse here and maybe talk about the Darce choke, a choke that, again, like I said, for me is sort of outside of my core competencies. But man, people I know who are good at the Darce, they are able to get that from everywhere. They're able to build entire game plans around it. So yeah. with that said, I'll, I'll hand the buck back to you here. Why don't you tell me what's so great about the Darce choke, how you kind of landed on this one, what you like about it and and what you find so consistent and useful about it. Sure. First off, I just wanted to say it, it's funny that you bring up Scaff because I'm actually recording this. I'm on a trip right now. I'm in, I'm in their office. I'm sort of in the gym <laughs> by myself here. So I'm I'm recording in the same in the same spot, spreading the the opposite gospel here. <laughs> yeah, I it, how I landed on it. Let me see. So I started training in 2007, and that was the first year I remember. That was the first Nogi Worlds ever. Was that year? And I saw Bill Cooper get a couple of those at the Nogi Worlds, and I think maybe Jeff Glover got one too. And then a couple of months later was the ADCC where. Robert Drysdale got a Darce on Marcelo Garcia in the absolute finals. And it seemed like it was just sort of a very trendy technique of the moment. I mean, obviously back then things were really different. We did, The internet kind of hadn't exploded in our sport and our art like it has now. And so 
what was big back then, you know, by today's standards, I guess it wasn't that big, but it did seem to be sort of like the thing that people were talking about. And I even remember instructors and coaches were saying stuff like, oh, it's cheap. You don't have to pass the guard all the way to get it. It's kind of a, it's kind of a cheap move to do to people. And so when you're also like a white belt, you know, or like a lower belt, you kind of are like, oh, okay, they don't like it. So I'm going to do that, you know, kind of like a little rebellious streak maybe. So yeah, it just kind of seemed like the hot move of the moment. And also I thought it was interesting that, you know, a lot of Americans were doing it and I thought that was kind of cool. I was watching a lot of, you know, Ryan Hall and, you know, Lovato Jr. and Bill Cooper, Jeff Glover, guys like that, Keenan Cornelius a few years later, and all those guys were really good with it. So it sort of seemed like kind of a cool little American contribution to the, I know there's, you know, Brazilians that and Japanese grapplers that had done it too, but yeah, it, but it stood out for a few reasons. Yeah, that's a really good point to bring up, just the evolution and the popularity of this choke over time. When I started jujitsu back in the 2000s, I remember being taught the anaconda and I remember thinking that this was just a really cool choke. There was a lot of attention paid to that. And there was a bit of chatter about the Dars choke, but it was kind of, at least in my mind, this exotic sort of fringe thing. Mm -hmm. And over time, it's become popular and consistent to the point where I think you could almost consider it to be a fundamental technique at this point. I mean, I, I don't know if you would put it right in the same pantheon as the triangle and the arm bar, but right there in the next tier of fundamental techniques, I think you could talk about things like the Darce choke. And it's interesting because these days, I mean, other than our buddy Scaff, I don't see that many people who really focus on the anaconda. But the Dars choke, I think at this point, is probably more popular than the Anaconda, just in terms of practitioners who normally use it. And now that's totally anecdotal. I don't have any proof for that. Uh -huh. But in the gym, I see the Dars quite often. But I find that the Anaconda is actually, at least with my partners, it's quite rare to see. Yeah, I, I think it probably is a new a new school fundamental. I sort of call it exactly that, like a new school fundamental. I, I do think it's probably a little bit more common than the anaconda just by the numbers. But I do, I love the anaconda as well. They're both awesome. I actually struggled with the anaconda for a long time and SCAF actually, I'd even done like a private lesson with Hafa Mendez on it, who is really, you know, he kind of brought it back. He kind of evolved it a little bit for modern times and SCAF helped me even more with it than than some of that Hoffa training did. So I, I hope that Scaff can put out some Anaconda stuff at some point. I think he has some really, really special ways of doing it that I haven't seen before. But but yes, I, I agree with you about the darts, and I actually think it's making a bit of a comeback right now, if for no other reason than, you know, people are seeing the Rotolo brothers do it all the time. And when stuff is being seen, people are talking about it and they're practicing it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it's probably worth giving a, a bit of a, an explanation here in terms of the differences and the contrasts between these chokes, because to a junior person or someone not super fluent in these chokes, they look very similar and understandably so, because they from a mechanic standpoint, there's a lot in common. And I remember when I started off, it took me a long time to just be able to distinguish between the Dars and the Anaconda. <laughs> and sometimes I still have trouble, you know, when you're watching two guys spar and then you see someone just slam on a head and arm choke and everyone's moving really fast. Sometimes it's actually hard on the fly to tell, OK, what are, what are these people doing? Is this a Dars or is it an Anaconda? So it might be worth for the beginners just kind of breaking it down. The Dars choke and the Anaconda are both head and arm chokes where you're basically simultaneously latching onto the person's head and their arm. And like with a triangle choke, you're kind of compressing their own arm into one of the carotid arteries and then you're squishing their other carotid with your bicep in this case. The difference is how you clasp your hands. So with the anaconda, when you connect your hands, basically you're grabbing your bicep, you do that next to the person's shoulder. But with the darts, you invert the grips and you you clasp and connect your, your hand to your bicep closer to their neck. So they look very similar to the untrained eye. And they are both head and arm chokes in terms of how they operate. But they actually in terms of practicality, have totally different systems and game plans connected around them. And we talked about this a bit with Scaff when he was on the podcast, when we did our episode with him on the Anaconda system. But there are entire game plans around the Dars that you can build, ways that you can get it that are completely different from the Anaconda. So 
with that said, I would turn this over to you as the specialist here and just tell me in your mind, what are the key differences between the Dars and the Anaconda? Like what are the pros and cons and when would you choose one over the other? Sure. I think the Anaconda is, and I'll sort of start there because I think it illustrates a good way of thinking about the differences. With the Anaconda, your lock closes at sort of their shoulder armpit, like you said. So I like to say the anaconda ends at the armpit, sort of like a mnemonic device, the the two A's, the A and the A. Anaconda ends at the armpit. And whenever you have a a lock behind that armpit, that's the armpit shoulder area is always going to be the weak point of any arm triangle. That that's the spot where they're going to try to expand that trapped shoulder, expand that trapped arm and open up right there, right? So With the anaconda, your lock is the main thing keeping them from expanding and and opening that space that we want to have closed. Sometimes if you just use your lock, it can be a little bit easier for them to expand open. Now, so SCAF and some other people have come up with ways to drag the trapped arm open and sort of hold it open to make it more difficult for that person to open that space once that lock is closed. The DARS sort of inherently, your own shoulder, your own body is backstopped behind their armpit or their shoulder. That can make it a little bit easier for two equally skilled grapplers, let's say just beginners or intermediate. A lot of people seem, in my experience, to have some success with the DARS first because their own, the structure of their body is backstopping that armpit and it's a little bit harder for the person getting choked to open up that space to open up one of their carotid arteries. So I think the anaconda is is just as strong. I do think there's a couple of extra things you have to do, a couple of finesse plays to make it more difficult for the person to defend by opening up their chest, opening up the space between their trapped arm and their carotid artery. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it totally does. And another thing worth bringing up is that you often see these things engaged and used from different positions. So the anaconda choke, primarily the place you're going to see that is when you have a front headlock on your opponent. So you force Mm -hmm. them into a turtle, you're able to get a basically a front side seat belt on top of them. And then from there, you can gator roll or something into the anaconda. Whereas the Dars has so many different ways and places to enter it from, which is, I think, is one of the interesting things about the choke. Now, I, I know that Scaff talks about other ways to enter the Anaconda. He right. mentioned when he was on the podcast with us about doing it from even half guard or side control. But one of the novelties about the Dars choke is, and I think probably part of the reason why it's so devastating against white belts is because you can get that thing from anywhere. You know, the most typical place to get the, the Dars is from half guard or from side control if the person comes up Uh but you can get it from strange positions you can dar someone when they're on your back you can dar someone when they have north south on you there's a lot of really strange things there and That's one of the things about the Dars that I think where it makes things a little bit unique in the jujitsu landscape and the big impact it's had over time. There's a lot of positions that I used to think were generally really safe for me. But then I realized even from these positions, I can still get Dars. You know, North South is a great example. If you have someone pinned in North South. Before the Dars choke, I would have generally considered myself to be pretty safe hanging out on top of someone. But now I understand they do have that option. If I put my arm in the wrong place, they can Dars me from bottom north south. Absolutely. And similar. Yeah. And similarly, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it as a as a plan A, but there are people out there where if you take their back, they can actually darts you while you're on their back. So it's kind of a threat from everywhere. And that's one of the things about it that is unique is just sort of like the Kimura, your ability to use that latch onto it from everywhere and then slowly rotate and change your angle and eventually tighten it and lock it up. That's part of the versatility of the darts. Whereas with the Anaconda, Really, the only variation you ever see people do is they get it from the front headlock and they gator roll, and then they might try to walk towards the person's leg. Like the sequence is pretty similar no matter what, but the Dars has way more variability from what I've seen. 
Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the Kimura. So I kind of call it like the Kimura of chokes. You know, if the elbow is open, if there's daylight between the ribs and the elbow, it's there. You may have to contort your body a little bit to get it. Sort of like how when we do those rolling Kimuras, we may have to twist our body a little bit to get our arm through that space. But if there's daylight between the ribs and the elbow, you can you can start to snake that arm through there. And you may have to you know, rotate your upper body a little bit or, you know, adjust position. But yeah, it's there. It, it, anytime there's daylight in there. And especially if there's if they're side on. You know, if there's any kind of angle facing you, I get a lot of them from Toriando passes from the bottom. If someone's Toriando passing me, almost like an arm drag, you know, position when they sort of turn and sort of expose their shoulder toward my center line, kind of reaching up through there. Yeah, there's a lot of funky ones. I like the one when the person's on your back. You know, if you just get that arm to one side of your body, you can kind of reach up and and catch the back of the head and, and work it from there. It, it's really versatile. It, it can come from a, a lot of different positions. Okay, and another thing that I was that really stands out to me, I think a lot of people have sort of a misconception that it's you see it a lot from people with long arms because you need long arms to be good at it. In my mind, I think people with long arms may gravitate towards it. And then you see them do it from everywhere and people go, oh, they can do it from everywhere because they have long arms. But in my mind, it's more of, no, they have long arms, so they gravitated to it and now they see it everywhere. And because they see it everywhere, they're willing to to go for it from everywhere and see it from all these different positions. But I've helped a handful of people with it, handful of students with it over the years that only one of them really had longer arms, but all, you know, four or five of these people got really good at it in a short amount of time because they just started seeing it from everywhere. So I don't think long arms are a prerequisite to being able to have the versatility with it that you're talking about. Yeah, I think with the Darce choke, well, really with any head and arm submission, if you're attacking two limbs at the same time, you're always going to get into some debate about limb length and opponent size. Uh Uh-huh. I find generally, as someone who has shorter arms, if I'm fighting someone who's really big, my preferred attacks are going to be attacks where I'm attacking one thing. So that means I'm going to snap on maybe a a no-arm guillotine Uh or a rear naked choke or an arm bar. I find that when you're fighting up weight classes, it's usually easier to do a submission where you're attacking one thing, whereas I find... Things like triangles, arm triangles, they're harder to get if your opponent is much bigger. But the thing about the Darce choke, yes, if you have long arms, you're probably going to gravitate towards it because the setup will be easier. But the thing I like about the Darce choke is even if you have relatively short arms and even if you're fighting someone who is so big that you can't even really get a good connection on and grab your own bicep and that happens sometimes if you're fighting someone giant you might not even be able to lock your arms to get the darce choke Uh but the thing about the darce is even if that's the case it's still a tremendously powerful way to break the person's posture and attack them and advance position so this happens sometimes where You're trying to fight someone really, really big. You're in the process of passing their guard. They turn to their side and you get the Darce grip. But sometimes you just can't lock it. Maybe their defense is really good or maybe they just have a giant upper body and you just can't grab your own bicep. That's still okay because you can still do things like clasp your hands together and dig into the back of their neck and basically almost do like a can opener on them and collapse their posture. So even if, for whatever reason, you can't get the finish, the nice thing about the Darce choke is if you snap that on, you can basically can opener the person and break their posture. And that makes it so much easier to advance it or to transition into a different attack. So I would say, even if you're fighting a giant and you don't think you can actually finish the Darce on them, there's still that viable option of at least using it to break their posture. Yeah, I I agree. It's a flanking attack, right? So we don't need inside space to attack it in the conventional sense. When most people talk about inside space, we don't need to get inside of their body in the same way. We can sort of reach in to do it. And that allows us when we're cutting through the guard or passing, we can sort of cut through and attack it. And even if we don't want to finish the submission itself, it's a great way to get the bottom player to predictably put their back to the mat and allow the pass because they don't want to get choked with it or pop up to a turtle. And, you know, maybe you could switch to another 
head and arm attack, maybe a guillotine, or maybe you want to take the back or go for a crucifix. It's it's a good way to get predictable responses from the person that you're rolling with. Yes. Even if your goal isn't to finish it. And it solves a tremendously common problem, which is, like you said, dealing with your opponent getting to their side when you're doing a guard pass. One of the most common mistakes I see from beginners, but even right up to brown belt level, is people will try to pass the guard even when they don't have sufficient control to pin their opponent. So if you're in the process of a guard pass and your opponent gets up onto their side, you got a problem because if you keep trying to pass, there's a good chance they're going to dogfight and single leg you. It's just a situation that is not good. Before you finish the pass, you want to have their shoulders pinned to the mat and your opponent is predictably going to try to get up onto their side to prevent the pass. So one of the ways that you deal with that is you threaten a Dars because like you said, If someone is on their side and then you latch on the Darce grip, they've got a real tough decision there. They have to either abandon trying to get up on their side, which, like you said, means they got to get their shoulders back onto the mat, which opens up the pass, or they can continue trying to get up onto their side, in which case it's going to be a lot harder for them to single you, and they now have to worry about the fact that they've basically walked into a choke. So one of the most predictable things your opponent will try to do when you're passing the guard is come up onto their side, and the Darce is one of the most consistent answers to deal with that problem. It is, and I don't want to get too off topic of the Darce, but the Anaconda stuff, especially Matt Scaff stuff, has actually improved my Darce a lot as well. I do think, and you mentioned the guillotine, I'm, I am a big believer that that all three of those, it's sort of like a peanut butter and chocolate, peanut butter and jelly <laughs> thing. They, they do work better together than apart. And I think if you can keep people uh, not sure which one you're attacking – and they have to defend three psychologically. That's very difficult to not know exactly which one you're you're going for. And they just feed so well together. Whereas if they know they only have to worry about one, they can sort of put their defensive resources in the same basket. And yeah, mentally, they kind of know what to expect. But if, they, if they're sort of in like a washing machine and they're getting tumbled around and they're not sure which one you're going for, I think all three are super awesome together. And that's a really interesting thing, because when most people think of the Darce choke, I don't think they think of it as part of being a a portfolio of submissions like that. Uh I know that from the guard, classically, we generally consider the armbar, omoplata and triangle to be very closely related. And people learn as they get more advanced to switch between those three because they chain together. So there's kind of a system there. And like you said, because there's multiple options, it makes it harder for your opponent to know what you're going to do. And it makes it easier for you to transition if things aren't going in the direction you wanted. Whereas with the Dars, a lot of people, I think, don't think of it as part of a, a broader collection of submissions. If they see the Dars, they'll latch onto it. And the last thing they're thinking about is, OK, should I switch this to something else? But if you can do that, that's going to open up so many options for you, because one of the things about the Dars is the angle and the way that you finish it is very different from the way that you would finish an anaconda, for example, or the Mm -hmm. way that you would finish a guillotine. So depending on body positioning, if you can transition from one to the other, I can totally see how that would help you out. I mean, if you, for example, are stuck, if you're trying to dar someone, but they're you're in their half guard, for example, and you Uh just can't get your leg free. I can see how it could be hard to finish the darse. But if you were to then switch it to an anaconda somehow, From there, it's much easier to finish because you can coil the person up and and pull their own leg towards them, right? So that's one of the things about the anaconda in the Dars is because the grip is different, the angle of your body is different. So if you get to the point where you're doing a Dars and man, the, the angle of your body is just not right to finish, maybe switching to an anaconda or a guillotine would open up that right angle and get you to the point where you can get a realistic finish. 100%. I hope this isn't getting too esoteric, but if if somebody were trying to learn any of these, I really would suggest, you know, obviously, realistically, you're not going to get good at all three at the same time. You're going to gravitate towards one. But once you make an initial attack, focus on monitoring their posture, keeping their elbow away from their body and keeping their hand off of your hip. And as long as you have sort of those three controls, you know, you have a hand controlling their posture. You don't have to like death grip their posture, but just, you know, a a check on their head, keeping their elbow away from their ribs and, you know, making sure that their their underhook isn't like really around your body. Their hand isn't really up high on your hip. 
one of those three options, Doris, Guillotine, Anaconda, is going to start to feel comfortable and present itself to you. And then once you start to feel that first one have success for you, then maybe venture out and start to feel, you know, the next one that might present itself to you. And that's a good way to develop some proficiency with all three. And I would encourage people not to beat yourself up if you don't feel great at all three equally. You know, I I got good at the Dars first and then the guillotine and then now the anaconda starting to get there too. But yeah, it takes time, you know. Yeah, I think that's a a good point. When you're working on a system like that, you often aren't equally proficient at all parts of that system out of the gate. And you may never get there because everyone just gravitates towards certain things. Sure. So for me, I mean, out of the classic trifecta, the armbar, omoplata triangle, I'm much stronger with the omoplata followed by the arm bar, and my weakest is the triangle. And that's just something to, for me to work on, right? And for something for me to be aware of. So yeah, I think it's important for beginners to not beat themselves up because they haven't fully mastered every single possible yeah. submission. We need to have a more realistic view of how quickly we can learn and just be willing to assess where our holes are and, and work on those as they come up. Yeah. And that's interesting. The Omoplata is my weakest out, out of those three. And I'm actually making that kind of a project right now. I would say for most people, it probably is the weakest. I think most people gravitate more towards triangles and arm bars. But yeah, Mm -hmm. it's it's one of those things where jujitsu is so much about self-expression and everyone is going to have certain techniques and strategies that just gravitate towards them. And you would be foolish to ignore that because if your body and your mind just intuitively, naturally understand something, it's often good to lean into that because you'll probably have a quicker development with that skill set than with other things where it just doesn't feel like something that would be a good fit for you. That's not to say that you shouldn't learn things if it just doesn't quite feel right out of the gate because most things won't. But I think everyone who's trained for a while has had this experience where they discover a new sweep or a new submission and it just works for you right out of the gate. It just speaks to who you are. And so for that reason, I think that, yeah, if you look at this trifecta of attacks, probably everyone is going to have at least one that they they really gravitate towards. I, I think so, too. And can, can I add one thing like slightly off yep. off the Dars topic for, for beginners? And now that you mentioned that, I think you mentioned something really cool there about, you know, personal expression, which is a hugely important part of all of this to me and gravitating to certain things first. I think that people, I see so, I don't know if you see this on, on Reddit or other places online, but I see so many people that, you know, stress about what should I learn first? What, what's more important to learn as a white belt passing or guard play, or should I work submissions or positions? I legitimately think pretty strongly that People should work whatever they have fun with and whatever feels comfortable and they enjoy, as long as it's not, you know, annoying their coach or their, you know, training partners, you know, but to a certain extent, whatever keeps you coming back to the gym in those early stages, because jujitsu is so hard right at first. So, you know, yeah, if the omoplata is like your thing right out of the gate, stick with it and have fun with it and keep showing up to class and and you're going to get all the other stuff by showing up. But I legitimately think people should just pick what they enjoy and what what speaks to them and what gets them excited to keep coming to class. Yeah, I think especially when you're a beginner and you're bad at everything and you're getting tapped out 20 times every single class. Yeah. It's very beneficial to have at least one thing that you feel competent at. <laughs> you know, it, it, at least you're bad at something you enjoy, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you're just awesome at triangles and it's okay to lean into that because at least then when you're that demoralized beginner and you just you have no chance of you know, consistently tapping good people on the mats to have at least one thing in this massive sea of techniques that makes you feel comfortable and makes you feel like you actually know something that's super important when you're getting started. When you're on the the flip side and you're more experienced, then it's a different conversation. You can then start talking about reassessing the holes in your game and grafting on new techniques. But when you're a beginner, just starting to feel that degree of mastery where you start to feel like I actually know something. It's a very important psychological trigger for people if they want to stick around and have fun for the long term. Yeah, I think so too. Okay. So something I want to dig into here, you brought up three things that you said are kind of the the critical control points here for the, the Dars choke. And I think it's worth breaking them down. So refresh my memory here. You said the first one was having a hand to control their posture. What were the other two? Keeping the elbow open and keeping their hand off of your hip or their arm off of your back. Got it. Uh, So actually, so, so like I actually would, 
I highly encourage people not to try to dart choke through an underhook. Even though a lot of people do teach it that way against an underhook, I think it's really good to try to clear the underhook first, at least early on, until you get a little more proficient with it. Yeah, yeah. So let's dig through each of these, because I think that if there's one thing that people should take away from this, it's at least these three ideas that are going to help you lock out the Dars. The first one, which you brought up, is breaking their posture. Now, the way that you would normally do this with the Dars choke is because you're connecting your hands and your arms behind the person's neck. Basically, what you can do is use the Dars like a can opener where you can uh-huh. dig their head. You're trying to make their chin touch their chest, basically, just like with a can opener from someone's guard. And if you do that, it makes it way easier to pass the guard, to advance position and, and ultimately to finish the choke. And that's one of the things about the Dars that I think is different from the Anaconda, because with the anaconda you're connecting your hands by their shoulder so if you try to use your hands to crunch the person together what you're going to be doing is you're going to be compressing their own arm into their throat and that's how you get the choke but with the dars if you try to pinch basically and contract your body in together what winds up happening is you give the guy a bit of a can opener and that makes it so much easier to set up the pass Uh, that's one of the reasons why the dars choke is so awesome from half guard or from a guard pass Uh is because if you get that grip Even if you don't finish the choke, if you can connect the person's chin to their chest and break their posture that way, it's going to make it so much easier for you to pass and get to a better position. Yes, absolutely. A lot of people call that the vice grip or it's sort of the grip. If people look up a Japanese necktie, it's it's the same sort of grip for that submission. Uh, In recent years, I've actually... So yes, you can absolutely control the posture that way. It's strong. I won't knock it at all. I've done it a ton. In recent years, I've actually gotten a little more towards using a guillotine style to control the posture and then feeding the choking arm through. So if we're passing to our left, like knee cutting with our right knee cutting across, and they're coming up on their right side, their left arm is coming toward us, instead of just reaching our right arm through the back of their armpit going behind their neck, that is great. I'm not going to knock it. But one thing I've just been doing recently is taking the left arm and going over the top of their head, almost like we're going for like an arm in guillotine. And then I'm, I'm finding that coming around that way and getting a guillotine style control, we can still monitor, we can still break their posture really strong with that guillotine grip with the left arm behind their head. And they aren't quite sure, are they going to go for a guillotine on us, an arm in guillotine? Are they going to fall down for an anaconda or are they going to punch their right arm through for the Dars? So I'm liking that. I'm finding that's almost as much control to bring the chin to their chest that you're talking about as that traditional kind of gable grip, palm to palm vice grip behind the neck is. But with that gable, palm to palm vice grip, Japanese necktie grip behind the neck, there's the the only attacks they really have to worry about are the Dars or the Japanese necktie. But if we if we lead with our second arm, our left arm behind their head, then they aren't quite sure. It could be a guillotine. It could be a Dars. It could be an anaconda. And it does sort of split their defensive resources. But I don't want to knock the, the, what you described because that is a very strong play as well. Well, that's a really good point, which is I think that when a lot of people set up the Dars choke, the thought process is – They wait for the person to come up and try to underhook them, and then they shoot their arm through and try to get it around, and then they worry about the other arm. But what you're talking about is rather than trying to lead with that arm that you shoot through when the person comes up for the underhook, you basically do a hip switch and go for a guillotine on the person, and then you shoot the arm through second. 1,000%. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the thing I love about that is it's a lot less predictable to your opponent because one of the challenges with the Dars is once people learn to see it, they'll wait for that hand to shoot through and then they'll just block the hand and then you're kind of stuck, right? Yes. Whereas if you go for a guillotine first, the nice thing about going for a guillotine is if you try to guillotine someone the predictable thing that they will do is they'll start bringing their hands up to try to fight the guillotine, right? Because they don't have a lot of choice. If you're trying to choke someone, they have to defend the choke. And by doing that, when they bring their hands up, that can make it easier, theoretically, for you to snake the other arm through and then actually transition into the Dars. Absolutely. Yes, because when their hands come up to defend, their elbows come away from the ribs a little bit. And then that gives some motion to kind of saw the head and arm arm through. 
whether it be Darce or Anaconda. And then if they open up their shoulders to defend the Anaconda or the Darce, then the space underneath the chin opens up for the guillotine to come back into play. And it's just like you said, right? You said that the Darce is kind of becoming a new school fundamental, a new school basic. And since it's so common now, it's kind of a technique everybody knows. When that arm is punching through, people know what's coming. And a lot of Darces still get gotten from there. But but yeah, sometimes people can, they can defend that. So I'm finding these past couple of years that almost doing that hip switch first and covering the back of the head with the guillotine arm is just a little bit easier to get against people that might have a good eye for spotting and coming early. Now, this chains nicely into the second main point you brought up about how to get the Dars, which is you have to have your opponent's elbow open. And for those who aren't familiar with this terminology, basically that means you don't want to have their elbow glued to their ribs. I mean, anyone who has listened to this podcast has heard me go on and on about limb coiling and the importance of keeping your elbows pinched in unless you've got a really good reason not to. And this especially comes up when you're getting your guard passed or you're in side control on the bottom. I always tell people, okay, look, if you are getting your guard passed, your number one priority before you start trying to launch into any fancy or fancy retention thing, your number one priority should be retract everything, get your elbows in, because if your opponent completes the pass, uh, first of all, if you retract everything, it's harder for them to complete the pass. But second, once you're in defense mode, you cannot let them get access to and control of your elbow, because that's when a lot of submissions happen. And that's when a lot of really bad pinning situations happen. So what you're talking about is this idea of an open elbow where you as the attacker are trying to prevent your opponent from connecting their elbow to their ribs. Yes. Ryan Hall has talked quite extensively about the importance of an open elbow. And like you said, this is required if you want to do a Darce choke, because if the person is able to glue their elbow to their ribs, you simply cannot shoot that hand through to get the choke. It's not going to happen. So you've got to find a way to open up that space. And that's one of the situations where that guillotine you suggested could be helpful, because if you threaten a guillotine, your opponent will have to bring their hands up to defend, and that might create enough space for you to open and pull, pry their elbow free and get your hand in there. Yes. Yes. So I actually, it's funny you mentioned Ryan Hall. I sort of got this. I wish it were still in print. He has a DVD on arm triangles and it's mostly on the classic arm triangle and the Dars. And he's big on making a check behind the elbow. So sort of your overhook is behind their elbow as they're underhooking you. And then you just swing your weight out towards their head and it sort of brings their elbow from close into the ribs to kind of flare it out. And then as it flares out, then you have space to reach in for the Darce. And that's that's when the limb length becomes less of an issue. If you're trying to sh- punch a Darce through a strong underhook where their elbow's close to the ribs, yeah, you, you need long arms to do it. But if you can if you can force them to open that elbow, whether it's, you know, making a check behind the arm and swinging your weight out towards their head to where it opens it up forcefully, or whether it's attacking a guillotine and they reach the hands up and the elbow comes open, whenever that elbow gets drawn open, you're going to need a lot less limb length to get behind their neck. And another big misconception is most people try to go way too deep with the Dars. You don't really need to be any deeper than your thumb along the back of their neck. So if you can make a thumbs up sign along the back of their neck, you're as deep as you need to be. And it shouldn't be that difficult if you can get a little elbow exposure to, to get to that thumbs up, that rule of thumb is what I believe Ryan Hall calls it. And I, I still use that terminology. <laughs> That's awesome. I never actually heard that, but rule of thumb is a great name for that. And yeah, I think when people when people see and think about things like the Dars choke or the anaconda, they have this kind of romantic idea of what it should look like and how you should get your hand shot way through, yeah. like all the way through. And I mean, look, if you get that, that's awesome. It's going to really suck for the other guy if you're able to get that. But even if you aren't able to get that deep, just locking up the Dars allows you to start breaking their posture and advancing position. And if you do that, then eventually you can improve position to the point where the limb length becomes less of a consideration. Something that a guy taught me once, I I trained with this just gigantic dude Uh uh, who was kind of a dar specialist and we were working darses and I just couldn't do it because this guy was too big. But he taught me a, a really good pointer for the dars, which is, okay, if you're in 
let's say that you're in like a, a someone's half guard or side control or something. These are normally the main positions where the Darce Joe comes into play. So let's say that you're in half guard, you're in side control, your opponent comes up onto their side, you snap on that Darce Choke, but your arms just aren't long enough. You just can't connect. Or if you can connect, you don't feel like you have any power. Okay. Rather than trying to finish from there, what he suggested to me was pass and cycle through and go to north south on the person while you're still holding the dar grip and then from north south get up on your knees if you can't or if you have to but when you're in north south then adjust the grip because it's a lot easier to shoot your arm through and get it tight from north south and then you can go back to side control if you or half guard if you want to to finish but that was a very helpful pointer for me which is rather than trying to punch my arm all the way through when i i've got the person in half guard if i can't get it at least latch my hands together and break their posture and then go all the way through to north south deepen the grip there and then work on finishing and submitting from there. And I found that to be super helpful. Yeah, I I love that. And if you think about it in a way, that is sort of another way to think about in a way he's, he is sort of opening that elbow and and making sure it's not around the body anymore and then coming back. Yeah. Get the grip where you want it and to finish. And there's just so many positions to finish it too. I, I can't think of another submission that has so many distinct finishing angles it can be finished you know from cross body half guard the full mount is might be my favorite one it can be finished sort of underneath the person walking in like homer simpson more like an anaconda yeah. that's probably my second favorite first or second way to finish it it can be finished from closed guard knee on belly there's just a ton of different angles to finish it once you have it fully locked up yeah yeah Now, what I want to dig into now is that third point that you brought up, which is you have to be very mindful of where the person's underhook is if they're trying to come up and underhook you. And I want to get your explanation here because this is something that I suck at. (laughs) And I think a, a lot of people can probably relate where their opponent gets up on their side and you think, awesome, I can see a window, I can see a pocket, I'm going to shoot through and I'm going to get a whizzer or I'm going to get go for a Darce choke. So you go for that overhook, but then you realize the angle's not right. <laughs> this isn't working for me. I don't have any power here. This guy's still got a good underhook. So I'd love to dig into your, your thought process here. How do you want to attack this when the person is coming up for like an underhook on you and you decide to go for the Dars? Where do you need their hand and arm to be in order to get an effective Dars choke on them? I would prefer that their hand be on the floor, right? So if their arm is coming up around you, let's still say that you're reaching through with your right arm as the Dars arm and their left arm is coming around your back, you can do a sort of a half sprawl. You can sprawl out with your right leg and a lot of times that'll make their hand hit the floor and it'll make a sound. It'll sound like they're doing a one tap, tap on the floor, you know? And then that's a that's a good point to unsprawl your leg and bring that knee back in close tight and then it should be harder for them to get get the arm up on your hip anymore. You can, a lot of times as they underhook, they're going to come up to their knees. And I think a lot of people lose Darces because they insist on trying to stay on their knees and and finish it there. It, it, it's not really best like that. You know, when you see the best Dars guys and girls in the world do it, they're not afraid to slide and maybe sacrifice top position even to go for it. So if if we're cutting through with our right knee, punching our right arm through that left arm is coming up for the underhook and they're coming up to their knees even to maybe try to single leg us sliding in on the right hip while we control the back of their head is going to make that underhook fall off our body and hit the floor and we're going to hear that hand hit the floor and then their arm is between us and them then we can lock up and walk into them like a clock you know like that homer simpson walk and it's going to drop them onto their hip And we can walk in and trap a leg like that anaconda finish or step over the body for the mounted finish. But I think people try to stay on their knees. And even when they get the lock, our training partner or our opponent will pop up to their knees and people will try to squeeze it from their knees or try to drive the person back on their side. And it's really hard to drive someone back on their side once we have our figure four lock in place. So at that point, I think it really is best to slide to a hip And we still have such good control over their posture that it's not that risky for them getting on top 
position. You know, as long as we stay snug and stay on our side, tight on our hip, it's going to kill that underhook, get that hand off our hip and still give us a really strong finish. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it totally does. So it sounds like you're saying that when you go for the Darce choke, ideally you don't want the person to have an underhook on you. You want that hand to be planted on the floor somewhere, right? Yeah, or between our bodies or something, but definitely not on the hip or around the body. I mean, look, I'm six feet tall. I'm not like string being lanky, but I'm I'm taller than average. And I could probably abuse my arm length a little bit and finish through some underhooks. But I don't usually like to do that. And when teaching people to do it, I just find unless someone's really tall, it's not going to work that well. And if it does, it's going to be crankier and a more painful submission as opposed to like a clean strangle or a clean blood choke. So yeah, I, I would prefer there not be any connection from their arm that's being driven into the side of their neck to not have that arm around our body or high up on our hip or around our leg, you know? Yeah. And that's another great example of where that switch to the guillotine helps out. Because if you're in someone's half guard or side control and they come up to their side and you go for the darse, but they've got an underhook on you. And so maybe their their arm is wrapped around your hip or it's wrapped around your back and you just can't get power with that arm you're trying to shoot through. If you switch to a guillotine, now your opponent has a dilemma because (laughs) there is a legitimate choking attempt. One of the things I love about the guillotine beyond just the sheer power of the choke is the response to the guillotine is so predictable. I don't care who you are or what position we're in. If I try to guillotine you, you will bring your hands up to try to fight the choke because the alternative is to get choked. You have to take the guillotine seriously. So if you want to dar someone, but they've got that underhook and their arm is wrapped around your body, you just can't get your arm all the way through, a switch to the guillotine is going to force your opponent to bring their hands out to start defending that choke. And that can create the opening because now they might have to abandon that underhook where now you can switch back to the Dars. So that's where this game becomes important of being able to switch from one of these chokes to the other to the other. Much like how with the, the classical trifecta of like the triangle armbar and omoplata, you know, if you're trying to armbar someone and the angle switches to the wrong side, then you can go to the omoplata. Or if they bring their head into range, you can switch to the triangle and then if you're there in the triangle and they try to turn away or tuck their arm you can switch to the omoplata the ability to transition into and out of these submissions is what makes them super powerful and i love this idea of taking the darce and adding in the guillotine and the anaconda into that whole system yeah yeah absolutely and if if anybody wants to watch some of this in action there's a youtube channel called count films that's kind of posted a lot of stuff this year of like craig jones rolling at b team and he hasn't done it in any matches yet but if anybody wants to dm me or anything i can send some uh stuff i have on a google doc of some roles posted this year but craig jones is an absolute killer with the dar chokes and guillotines as well. And some of the best I've seen, to be honest. And he he's doing it with the guillotine as the first play, with the guillotine attack first. And then, you know, if they defend, maybe jump in his arms to a Darce or an Anaconda. But there's probably at least 50 or 60 examples of, of him doing this in like training footage that's been posted all year long. I haven't seen many people talk about it, but it's definitely out there. If anybody wants to see that specific style in action from some recent footage. Awesome. Now, I would ask just on this topic, is there a point at which the Darce is not viable? This is a consideration that I always have, which is that when you're dealing with massive size and weight discrepancies, usually attacks that focus on one limb are going to be more effective if you're going for a finish. So Mm -hmm. that means a lot of leg locks, a lot of arm bars, the rear naked, the guillotine. It's pretty rare to see a smaller person triangle a bigger person or Uh complete an arm triangle choke on a bigger person like a Darce or an Anaconda. And I'd love to get your feedback on that as to whether there's like a a, a point of no return, at which point the size discrepancy is just too big and you'd be better off switching to something else. Have you ever encountered a ceiling like that with the Darce choke? Yeah, I definitely think it's there. I don't have a, a sort of a percentage thing totally figured out, but I know I'm 175 pounds and I know that when people start to get above like 205, 
I start to not try to finish it. You know, I will still use it to to pass or to take the back or to to switch to guillotines or other attacks. I, I still think there's a lot of utility there, but I don't. Yeah, once somebody's about twenty to thirty pounds bigger than me, maybe thirty pounds, twenty five, thirty pounds, I try not to put as much effort in in trying to finish the actual submission itself. So I still think it's, I, I mean, I think it's a good tool for anybody of, of any size to put some effort into unless they just are literally built like a little T-Rex. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, sometimes you just look at something and you know, like, that's not for me. You know, I'm not trying to say it's for everybody, but I, I think it's for more people than people realize. Well, the other thing, too, about the Dars is that because you're attacking from the top side and you're putting so much pressure down on your opponent, even if there isn't really a viable finish there, you can still use it as a pressure technique just to break your opponent's morale and drain their energy. Because even if your arms are not long enough to get the finish, you can still gable grip on the Dars and just put a ton of pressure on top of the person's head, keep them stuck in that awkward position on their side, and that can work against even larger opponents. I do this a lot with arm triangles. I mean, a lot of arm triangles are attacked from the top. Whereas, you know, a lot of people, I think it's kind of just a a common practice that if you're smaller, you probably don't want to try to triangle a bigger guy from inside your guard. But the difference there is that if you're doing that, you're on the bottom. Whereas if you're on top of someone, and even if they're much bigger than you, if you get an arm triangle or a darse or something like that, even if you're not able to actually finish it, You can hold it because you're in top position and you can break their morale, you can drain their energy and you can let them get stuck there. And eventually, ideally, you want to get them to the point where they're frustrated or exhausted enough that they make a bigger mistake. So it's still a very useful technique against a larger opponent, but you just might find that you're better off using it as a pin and a posture break than as a submission. Yeah, I've seen. I don't know if you if you've seen this, but when the Meow Brothers first started doing nogi uh, a handful of years ago, they used that classic arm triangle from the top all the time to cook to cook opponents in some of those absolute weight classes. I've seen Paulo yeah. and Joel do that a lot. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. That's why I actually really like the arm triangle. I mean, I never finish anybody with it, even with smaller guys. I just, I don't have a lot of arm length. I'm not an arm triangle specialist, at least from a finishing standpoint, but I love the technique as a pin, right? And I mean, that's what katakatame is, right? Katame means hold. It is a, it is a shoulder hold. If you can finish the person from there, That's fantastic. But a lot of the time with the arm triangle, what you can do is you can use that to break the guy. Then you can use it as a transition into neon belly and into mount. And then you might have better luck finishing from there. And with the Dars, you can also use it as uh, a way to keep your opponent in a very compromised position while you set up something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's perfect for that. Yeah, there's I think there's so much utility to every submission we do, you know, beyond submitting the person, right? I mean, what are submissions, if not just really strong positions? Yeah. You know, they, it's just a different kind of position. It's not a pin maybe, but it's a, uh, or maybe it is. But. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I mean, a submission really is just a pin with so much pressure and alignment breakage that yeah. the other person's actual body is at risk and they have to tap out, right? But other than that, if you're doing submissions properly, they should be a variation of a position because if yes. you don't have enough control to hold the person there, then your submission is not really a great submission. You're kind of going for like the equivalent of a flash knockout where you're trying to do a ton of damage before your opponent is able to pull something free. I would always prefer to have control and be able to hold that position before I start worrying about breaking something. Yeah, you, yeah, you said it better than me. That's what I was kind of going for, and you said it perfectly. Awesome. Well, I would ask you for people listening out there if they have if they are now persuaded that they should get into the Dars game. I would ask you: Are there any hacks or quick lessons that you recommend for people? Just little pointers that will help supercharge their Dars game out of the gate if they just start doing these things from day one. Yeah, there's a little drill that I think that that people can do. I, I would say. Two things. The first drill would just be to grab a compliant partner, just a friend at the gym, and have them lay on their their side and reach one hand behind their armpit and then out past their neck. Just rule a thumb, thumb deep, and then don't even lock up your second hand. Practice 
rolling their shoulder into the side of their neck and, you know, just move your head kind of over their head. And it's going to, if you imagine a bubble of air between their shoulder and the side of their neck, you want to pop that bubble with their shoulder. So uh, you hear the Danaher guys talk about losing the shoulder when they teach triangles and and darses and, and anacondas and stuff. And, and it's because by trying to lose the shoulder out of the lock, you're you're dropping their shoulder into the side of their neck. So I say like lose the shoulder to use the shoulder. So uh, use that one arm behind their neck and then just try to roll their shoulder into their side of their neck and see if you can just get them. You could never get a tap in a full roll like this, but see if you can get them to just kind of feel the blood flow getting cut off and see if you can just get a tap with one arm. And then the second drill I would say is to just reach behind again their neck. This time you don't have to try to choke or anything, but just cup the back of their head and then ask your partner to move around a little bit. I got this drill from Ryan Hall during a visit to 50-50 and just ask your partner to kind of move around and have them come up to their knees, have them throw their back on the mat and you just kind of keep the connection from your shoulder into their armpit and your hand along the side of their neck, cupping the back of their head and just move with them, you know, mount them, slide underneath them when they come up to all fours, when they go to their back, somersault and go with them, you know, pull guard uh, if they pop up sometimes and just practice moving around and keeping that connection there because it is kind of a mobile submission when it's expressed at its highest point. So those two drills, I, th- I think, are really great. Learning to kind of finish with one arm against a relaxed training partner and learning to kind of move around with the submission. You mentioned guillotines and no arm chokes. If you watch Marcelo Garcia with his guillotine, he doesn't really care where you go when he gets those hands around the neck. You can stand up, sit down, pull guard, pop up the turtle. No matter where you go, he's just going to follow you. And I I think the Dars is very similar to that. Yeah, I love that idea of the Dars as a mobile submission. And I would say that's something that it has in common with the Anaconda. We, I was talking to Matt Scaff about this on our previous episode with him, where with the Anaconda, you often don't just latch it on and squeeze and finish. Usually where the Anaconda gets to a finish is you rotate, you gator roll, and when you spin your body, it tightens the choke. It's like a key turning into a latch, right? It, it, that's how, that's the mechanic to really tighten it up. You don't just squeeze, but by turning your body and moving, you actually constrict the choke more. And I've noticed that with Darst guys, they do the same thing where they'll go for the Darst, but they don't just sit there and squeeze from the top. They roll, they rotate, and they just continuously cinch that choke tighter and tighter and tighter that's the way to go yeah yep well i would ask you then before we tie this up anything that we missed any other big ideas or concepts about the darts that you want to drop here before we wrap i mean the one thing that we didn't talk about i think there's a lot of a lot of good plays for it from the bottom you know i probably get a lot of my setups these days from you know kind of arm drag situations from people passing the guard from people trying body lock passes yeah, I, I mean, that's sort of a maybe a whole nother rabbit hole that we don't want to go down right now. But I would just say once you see it everywhere, especially on top, you will start to see it from the bottom as well. There there are definitely some some good entries for it from bottom position. Yeah. And you know what? This is something where I think everyone needs to understand that, yes, ideally you as a general statement, you probably don't want to be attacking submissions from inferior positions, but it's awesome when you do. <laughs> and yeah. and there's definitely a place for that. You know, when we talk to beginners, we always tell them, don't go for like weird suicide submissions from the bottom. You know, if you're stuck uh-huh. in bottom side control, you probably don't want to be trying to sub the guy from there. We tell beginners that, but we tell them that because we want them to build good habits and not just be trying to submit at all costs. However, Once you get really experienced to the point where you know how to keep yourself safe from those bad positions, it is okay to then start attacking submissions from the bottom because it adds a very interesting threat and and a new way to get out of those bad positions. I do this a lot where I will Ezekiel people from crazy positions on the bottom and 
I can do that because I've trained it for long enough that I know how to keep myself safe doing it. I know how to set up a choke from those positions where I won't get arm barred or choked myself. And if you have a good submission from a bad position like that, you can kind of use it like a porcupine uses its quills where, you know, you, yeah. you're, someone's not attacking okay. you and the quills come out. It's like, look out, you better back away from me. And that's a really good way to get out of these bad positions because yes, you can escape, you can sweep, you can reverse. Those are ways to get out, but you can also attack in such a way that your opponent knows they have to back out and make space to keep themselves safe. And if you do that, you can force them to abandon the good position. So if you're a really good Darce player, if you're darcing people from weird, crazy positions, once they start to see that threat, you might find that you can force them to abandon really good uh, positions that they might otherwise want to maintain. Yeah, yeah, I I, and I dig it. I like the porcupine analogy. That's good. I might have to borrow <laughs> that. Yeah, go ahead and steal it, man. Well, hey, I love this conversation. If people want to follow you, check out your posts or your work, how do they go about getting in touch with you? Sure. I'm, I'm pretty easy to get in touch with. So on Instagram, I'm just Drew Darce, D-R-E-W-D-A-R-C-E. And it, on Reddit, I'm Darce underscore night and... I'll respond to anything. If you have questions about this, if you have questions about anything at all, I may, you know, it may take me a couple of days to get back, but I will do my best to help anybody uh, with anything that wants to drop me a line. I did start that podcast. Uh, I'm just calling it Drew Dars for now. I'm going to try to come up with a more creative name, but right now I'm trying to upload at least once a week. Sometimes I'm hitting twice a week. I'll have one tomorrow morning which will, yeah, it might not be by the time this airs, I guess it'd be out already. Yeah, most likely. And um, yeah, I just, just a couple super quick thank yous, you know, thanks to Brandon McCatherine and Matt Scaff for, for having me in their gym here. I love coming out here. And Brandon actually is the guy that kind of gave me those three rubrics about monitoring the posture, opening the elbow, keeping the hand off your hip. And then back home in North Carolina, big shout out to uh, Cody Maltese at Elevate MMA for, you know, being one of my coaches there and really helping my guillotine game, which is up to my Darce game as well. And then my other gym in North Carolina, uh, Salty Dog Jiu-Jitsu, John Salter and Joe Selecki, who John's helped me a lot with my Darce and front headlock stuff as well. And I'm yeah training really hard there right now. So yeah, everybody back home. Awesome. And I'll put your links into the show notes. So if anyone wants to quickly just jump through and find you, I'll put the links there so that people can just click through. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, man, I can tell you one thing, which is that when Robert Deagle and Margot Ciccarelli came on this podcast, within like a month, they got their black belts. So just saying, you know, probably pretty next time you come on, we're going to have to call you Professor Darce instead of just Drew. I I know you're not supposed to say it, but man, I've, <laughs> I've trained for a long time. I'm ready. I'm, I wouldn't be mad at that. I'm, uh, <laughs> this is like my seventh year at Brown Belt. So I'm definitely <laughs> I wouldn't mind getting it over with. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again, man. I really appreciate you coming by. This was a super fun conversation. Likewise. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yeah. Oh, and one more thing, of course, just to everyone out there who listens, if you want to get in contact with me, best way to do that is just go to bjjmentalmodels.com. That's where there's a, a contact form to shoot me a message. It also links off to all of the podcast episodes and a written form content that we've done. You can find it all there. And beyond that, if you want to support us on premium, I always recommend that to any hardcore BJJ Mental Models listener. You can check that out at premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. In addition to being the single best way to support the show, that's all also where we have tons of long form content structured more like courses, really good place to learn more about jujitsu strategy and to do a deep dive into things like mindset. And of course, I'll also uh, review your rolling footage. If you're a member of premium, there's a free trial. So please do check it out. It really makes a difference and it helps fund this project. Premium.bjjmentalmodels.com is the place to go. I greatly appreciate it. So thanks in advance. Drew, great chat, man. This was a ton of fun. And yeah, I'm looking forward to you being a black belt next time you're on the pod, man. It's going to be great. Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate you, man. This means a lot. It's a little nerve wracking, you know, putting myself out there a little bit more. So I really appreciate you, you know, having me on and, and everything. And it, it means a ton. It, it really does. So thank you so much. No problem, my friend. And of course, to everyone out there who listens for an hour every week to us, greatly appreciated. Always flattering that people are willing to give their time and attention here to BJJ Mental Models. So thanks again so much. Greatly appreciated to you as well. And we'll talk to everyone next week. 